welcome to uh, Johan Ettinger's lecture. We would like to um, dedicate this lecture tonight uh, in memory of our dear friend, Howard Grief, who uh, passed away yesterday. You must uh, have heard about it. Uh, who was a fighter for Elat Israel, for the rights of the Jewish people to Elat Israel, and uh, who wrote the book about the legal rights uh, uh, of Israel uh, according to international law to Elat Israel, and this evening is, is in his memory, and Ilui Nishmato, when you say that. We would like to thank uh, Gabi and Dvoa Henter, who opened their house to us, and uh, for this evening, thank you, and uh, helped organizing it. Tonight's lecture is part of a series of lectures around the country to promote the application of Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, organized by the Committee for the Application of Israeli Sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, founded by Women in Green. And now we are here to hear Joram Ettinger. And so tonight is the third uh, uh, lecture of the series of lectures that deal with this issue of how to apply sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. And our dear friend, Ambassador uh, Joram Ettinger, is going to speak. He's an insider on US-Israel relations and Middle East politics. He's a member of the American-Israel Demographic Research Group, which has documented dramatic flaws behind demographic fatalism on one hand and a Jewish demographic momentum on the other hand. He's a consultant to members of Israel's cabinet and Knesset and regularly briefs US legis legislators and their staff on Israel's contribution to vital US interests. Ambassador, Ambassador Ettinger's op-ed pieces are published uh, in the Hebrew and English uh, press in Israel and abroad, uh, and of course on your website, the Ettinger Report, correct? Um, Joram uh, served as Israel's consul uh, to Houston and uh, as director of Israel's government press office, and if I was going to read you everything Joram does, I, I would stay here the whole evening, but the most important thing is not all those titles. Joram, we see you, Judith and I, as the ultimate optimist the one who always gives us strength. And uh, tonight, Yoram is going to talk about the Arab Peace, Pro the Arab Peace Program Plan, suicidal uh, uh, proposition. Bvakasha, Yoram. Okay, good evening. Uh, there's a story about a person who wants to take a nap in the afternoon, and uh, the kids are playing downstairs. He cannot fall asleep, and he opens the window yells at them, begs at them, nothing happens, they continue to play and the uh, noise is unbearable and uh, then he comes up with an ingenious idea, he yells, hey kids, what are you doing here? They're giving away oranges in the nearby market and within 30 seconds the place is empty, quiet, he goes back to bed, almost falls asleep and then it occurs to him, what am I doing here? They're giving away oranges <laughs> in the market and he runs to the market. And it seems to me that this has been more or less the role or the fate of the two-state uh, solution uh, idea. It has been mentioned again and again and again and people have come up with the idea that indeed there is a practical solution for both Jews and Arabs in this area. It's a two-state solution. So what are we doing here dealing with one state under Jewish sovereignty? Let's go to the market and share the free uh, oranges, <coughs> this delusional product uh, with uh, everybody else. And when we observe When, when we observe the idea of a two-state uh, solution of a Palestinian state or any foreign entity in Judea and Samaria, we should be very careful not to fall into any trap without proper examination, without proper editing. Most recently, we have been privy to a supposed uh, Arab peace plan 
which Secretary of State John Kerry has promoted along with our own president and indirectly along with our Prime Minister who talks about the danger, supposed danger of a binational state and therefore going back to the Bar Ilan uh, speech and invariably we're talking about the establishment in Israel which has more or less embraced the two-state solution and I contend, I contend without proper examination of the proposition. And a proper examination calls to check the track record of the whole uh, idea. And the track record may start as recently as the Arab Street. We have been privy to some very seismic developments on the Arab street in the last two and a half, three years, beginning with Tunisia through Egypt and Libya and Yemen and Bahrain, now in Syria. The question is when in Jordan and not whether in Jordan and subsequently probably in the uh, Gulf uh, states, uh, Kuwait, uh, Iraq is already boiling, has become one of the major arena for international and Islamic uh, terrorism. Saudi Arabia probably is not going to escape the wrath of the Arab uh, street. And while the promoters of the two-state solution, Israelis and Americans alike, uh, uh, John Kerry, Shimon Peres, and the media in America, the, convent, the established media in Israel, referred or still refer to the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, in fact, we never had an Arab uh, Spring. It has been a pretty stormy Arab winter, objectively speaking, realistically uh, speaking. Uh, no one can refer to the reincarnation of MLK uh, spirit on the streets of Cairo or Mahatma Gandhi. And those were the references by John and Hillary Clinton and uh, President Obama when the initial eruptions took uh, place. Certainly we don't face, we are not faced with a Facebook uh, revolution or as recently pronounced in Washington as uh, an, a transition to democracy uh, from authoritarian uh, regimes. The reality has been that we are talking about the Middle East as of today, which is the role model of violence, of intolerance among Muslims, intolerance among uh, Arabs. One can only guess what would be the fate of non-Muslims, non-Arabs, if that's the degree of intolerance which they demonstrate towards one another. We talk about the role model of instability, of unpredictability, of treachery and basically we're talking about an area which is uh, the top uh, fragmented area along tribal, ideological, geographical, <laughs> bless you, uh, lines and what does that bode for the Arab-Israeli uh, negotiation for the prospects of Arab-Israeli uh, peace when we see that reality among Arabs, among, uh, among Muslims. Certainly, the higher the unpredictability, the higher the violence, the lower the prospects for peace, and most importantly, in our case, the higher the value of any security uh, element. The threshold of security goes up uh, just in a, a compatible manner as does unpredictability, as does instability, as does violence in our uh, area. Certainly when we talk about the uh, past uh, uh, events since Oslo 1993, one cannot but conclude that as far as hate education, as far as terrorism, as far as non-compliance, we have managed 
to achieve, so to speak, uh, new records in the area since Oslo compared to the reality before uh, Oslo. Before Oslo, there was no hate education in the proper uh, school or education system in Judea Samaria for a simple reason, we did not allow it. There was, there were elements of hate education, but they were subdued by the presence of Israel. Since Oslo, hate education has become the worst uh, in the entire area, which is replete with hate education, and there is no more effective line of uh, production for terrorism, for suicide bombing, than hate uh, education. And certainly compliance <coughs> has not been the middle name of the Palestinian Authority and uh, we have had non-compliance after non-compliance and abrogation of agreements has been the characteristic of the relationship between the, uh, the Jewish state and the newly established Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Authority. Uh, we are talking about a track record in this area which goes back to the 20th and the 30th and the 40th with the pogroms, Arab pogroms against any Jewish presence in the area long before there was a Jewish state long before there was any Jewish presence in Judea and uh, Samaria in form of contemporary uh, settlements. We're talking about the track record between 1948, the first Arab-Israeli war, and until uh, today. And that track record delivers a very simple message. The conflict, as far as Arabs are concerned, has never been uh, about the size of Israel, the conflict has always been about the existence of Israel, and I emphasize Israel. I'm not so uh, uh, excited about the Arabs recognizing me as a Jewish state. I don't need it, quite frankly. Uh, I'm a Jewish state, whether the Arabs like it or whether the Americans like it, just as I'm not so excited about Americans telling me that I have the right of self-defense. Big deal. Sure, I have the right. I don't need anybody to tell me that. The same thing about a Jewish state. But when it comes to Israel, Israel's existence in the area, this has been the real issue and not the size, because if the size would have been the issue, we have had huge, huge uh, uh, inventory litany of cases where the Jewish state was willing to chop its own uh, area, going back to the Balfour de Declaration and everything which has uh, uh, been here, part of, of our reality since 1917, the Balfour Declaration. Let alone, let alone the Oslo Accords, which were uh, game-changing as far as gestures towards Arabs. Because that which the League of Nations never did, that which the UN never did, that which the Egyptians never did in Gaza, that which the Jordanians never did in Judea Samaria, a reckless Israeli government did in 1993. And the response by the Palestinian Authority was not Hakarat Tov uh, gratitude. The response was in the institution of hate education, the escalation of terrorism, and violation of every single agreement. And that by itself should deliver the message. We're not talking about their concern for any painful Israeli concession, they're talking about the elimination of Israel from the area, which is consistent with the chief track record required to examine the feasibility of a two-state solution, and the chief track record is that which goes back to the emergence of Islam, namely the 7th century. Since the 7th century until today, there has not been any, but any tolerance towards any non-Muslim sovereignty in the area. The issue has never been in this uh, area uh, as far as Muslims are concerned. 
how large would the so-called infidel entity be? As far as Muslims are concerned, this is all abode of Islam. Every piece of uh, land here is waqf, ordained by, divinely ordained to be Muslim uh, area, part of Muslim sovereignty. And as far as Muslims are concerned, there is simply no right for any non-Muslim to exercise sovereignty in the area. And therefore, one does not need to probe into Article 1 or Article 2 of any agreement. The bottom line is that Arabs are not concerned about the, the size, but the concern with the existence of uh, Israel. And certainly when one talks about the prospects of the Arab so-called peace proposal, uh, when one talks about the prospects of Oslo or Annapolis or Y Plantation or any other of this series of reckless uh, self-destruct type of Israeli initiatives since 1993, one cannot fail to note that since the 7th century, there hasn't been yet intra-Arab or intra-Muslim comprehensive peace. There hasn't been yet intra-Arab compliance or intra-Muslim compliance with majority of intra-Arab, intra-Muslim uh, agreements. And certainly there hasn't been since the 7th century uh, intra-Arab or intra-Muslim ratification of all intra-Arab, intra-Muslim boundaries. And last and not least, we haven't had yet a single Arab or Muslim demography Demogra uh, democracy, I'm sorry, democracy in the, in, uh, in the Middle East. And here we are being told by supposedly, ostensibly serious people who hold major, major positions in their uh, own countries, U.S. and Israel, that which the Arabs are yet to accord one another and that which they have not accorded to one another for 14 centuries. They're going to accord Israel if only Israel goes through painful concession. Those people, again, would rush to the market to buy oranges or, to put it in American terms, they would be very, very uh, uh, inclined to buy oceanfront uh, property in uh, Arizona. And certainly, if the deal would also suggest that if you buy that, the, the other party will throw the Golden Gate in for free, they would certainly grab that deal. It has nothing to do absolutely nothing to do with uh, reality. We're talking about the proposal to accord Palestinians, uh, Arabs in Judea Samaria, or maybe Arabs in Judea Samaria as well as Gaza, an independent state. And once again, people who talk about it fail to examine the track record of the Arabs that we are referring to. Because when one talks about the Arabs west of the Jordan River, we are talking about people who have been cons consistently allies of either enemies or rivals of Western democracies. We're talking about allies of the Nazis, we're talking about allies of the communist bloc, we're talking about allies of Khomeini, we're talking about allies of Saddam Hussein and allies of bin Laden. And the question is, why? Why would any sensible person who belongs to Western democracy, why would any such person be interested to provide a bonus to people who have shown their colors again and again and again over a very substantial period of, uh, of time. And certainly when we talk about the leadership of uh, the Arabs west of the Jordan uh, River in Judea, Samaria and in Gaza, there is a very interesting track record there as far as their role in the intra-Arab context. Because only uh, a week or a week and a half ago, we heard another very creative 
delusional idea by Secretary John Kerry, $4 billion to the Palestinian Authority. As far as I know, and I qualify, as far as I know, it has received a nod from uh, the Israeli government. I hope I'm wrong, but I, I suspect I'm not, uh, I'm not wrong in this regard. And I refer to it uh, in the context of, of tonight's uh, uh, discussion because the question is why should the Americans with their current major economic uh, problems which would take years not a year and not two and not three years but years to rectify why should they provide the Arabs west of the river the Palestinian Authority with four billion dollars why shouldn't the Arab oil producing, for instance, who benefit from $100 per barrel, why, should not they, why shouldn't they take care of this petty cash uh, item, $4 billion? Uh, and the response is very clear. Arabs do not shower the Palestinian Authority with their largesse. And there is a reason for uh, that. They haven't done it since 93. Oh, they pledged but they have never complied with their, uh, with their pledges and their contribution to the Palestinian Authority has been dwarfed, substantially dwarfed by European and American and international, uh, Japanese, etc. contribution to the Palestinian Authority. And the reasons, among others, has to do with the subversive character of the so-called Palestinian movement. There was a reason why Mahmoud Abbas and Arafat were evicted, had to flee Egypt in the late 1950s. They were two of the leaders of the Palestinian cell of the Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo. They were declared terrorist element by the government of Egypt and they had to flee due to their subversive activities in Egypt at that time. Syria, then the chief rival of Egypt over hegemony in the Arab world, offered them uh, asylum. But by 1966, when Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas and the rest of them felt strong enough, they started to initiate subversive activities inside Syria, among others, killing number of Syrian intelligence of officials. And they had to flee Syria for subversion. And it was Jordan, the Hashemite regime, which offered them asylum in Jordan in 1968. But by 1970, they felt strong enough in Jordan and they tried to topple the Hashemite regime, which triggered the Black September, which took a toll of some 20,000 PLO members. Many were expelled to Lebanon. Lebanon, it took them a few years to plunder and rape southern Lebanon. By the end of 1975, they felt strong enough to attempt and take over the central uh, role in Beirut uh, itself, which triggered the Syrian invasion of Lebanon at the request of the Christian element in uh, Lebanon, uh, the Christian government in Lebanon, which led to Black June, the massacre of June 1976. And since then, the PLO, Palestinian, uh, Palestinians in Lebanon, triggered series of civil wars, which led, among others, also to the expulsion from Beirut by Israel. But there was an expulsion from Tripoli, northern Lebanon, which was instigated by Syria, which did not appreciate, uh, appreciate the subversive nature of PLO activities in northern Lebanon, which also affected life in uh, Syria. And the latest chapter of PLO intra-Arab treachery took place in June of 19, in August of 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait with the assistance of PLO units which were stationed in Iraq, 
benefiting from Palestinian intelligence, from Palestinians residing in Kuwait, and that was the number one treachery, because going back to the 1950s, when Mahmoud Abbas and Arafat were expelled from Egypt, it was Kuwait which offered them to have residence in Kuwait. Gradually, they allowed them to bring into Kuwait their relatives and their friends and their allies to the scope of some 300,000 Palestinians. They allowed them to rise to the top bureaucratic and business positions. They even imposed a 5% excise tax on every Palestinian earning in Kuwait and they transferred it to the stashed account of accounts of Mahmoud Abbas and the Yasser Arafat throughout the world and it was that Kuwait which Mahmoud Abbas and Arafat stabbed in the back in August of 1990 when Saddam Hussein decided to invade uh, Kuwait. That was the reason for Sheikh Sabah of Kuwait when he was reinstated complement of American blood and American resources, the first thing he did was to expel almost all 300,000 Palestinians residing in Kuwait. And until today, whenever Mahmoud Abbas gets up to speak at uh, Arab League uh, events, usually either all or most of Persian Gulf representatives simply get up and leave the, the hall in protest. They don't forget and they don't forgive. And the question is, what does it take for Western democracies to realize that which the Arabs have experienced and at a quite substantial, uh, substantial cost? When one talks about that uh, track record, certainly it sheds light on the growing importance of the mountain ridges of Judea and Samaria. Because we don't just talk about Judea and Samaria as a geographic element, it is also and mostly a topographic uh, element. And when one looks at the topography of uh, Judea and Samaria, and then the sliver along the Mediterranean, one does not need to go to enroll in a military academy to realize that in that Middle East of the last 1400 years, in that Middle East of the Arab street of the last two and a half years, and in that particular area of the last 20 years since, uh, since Oslo, it is suicidal for anybody, let alone uh, Israel, to revert back to a waistline of 9 to 15 miles overtowered, dominated by the mountain ridges of Judea and Samaria, especially in that area, which according to any due diligence, according to any examination, shows that, that us that since the 7th century until today, and especially in the last two and a half years, this is an area which is not accustomed to agreements which are carved in stone. This is an area which is accustomed to agreements signed on ice. And certainly one therefore cannot rely on any such agreement as a foundation or a platform to propose any concession, let alone a painful concession. As far as concessions, we hear that the way to do it is to follow the supposed reasonable way as conducted between reasonable people, land for peace. And again, uh, we don't need to go through history to realize that very rare are the occasions of land for peace. But certainly, there is no such thing among reasonable people, land for peace, which whets the appetite of the violent or the violent partner to a conflict. Because at the end of the Second World War, we had certain uh, case of land for peace. Germany had to concede land to France and to Poland the, uh, the Czechoslovakia is as a result of its own violent manner 
it, which led to the Second World War. And as a result, Germany was punished by having to concede land in order to get peace. But the whole idea was land for peace intends to minimize the chance of the violent party renewing its violence. What we are experiencing since 67 is a revolutionary interpretation of land for peace. Because here we are being told that that party which initiated the violation of the status quo, that party which intended to harm the victim Israel, that party is going to be rewarded with land and supposedly that is supposed to cool its violent manner. This is simply out of touch with the nature of reasonable people or reasonable exchange, reasonable uh, negotiation. And we have, by the way, an interesting uh, precedent, 1948-49 war. At the end of the war, Israel gained substantial land, whether it was Jaffa, Lod, uh, Ramle, major parts of the Negev, most of the Galilee, let alone Jerusalem. West Jerusalem was not to, supposed to be part of, uh, of Israel. And Ben-Gurion was threatened by the US, by the entire world, by the UN, was pressured to give up the so-called occupied Negev and occupied Galilee, uh, etc. And Ben-Gurion did not. And the fact is that today the world considers those areas supposedly occupied in 1948-49 as part of the Israeli uh, terrain, part of Israeli sovereignty, they do not refer to it anymore as occupied land for one reason, because Ben-Gurion did not want to negotiate over such proposition. Ben-Gurion did not want to consider it. Sadly enough, we had in 1957 a different Ben-Gurion, because if Ben-Gurion of 1948 would have had the uh, the stamina, the backbone of 1957, there wouldn't be a Jewish uh, state. But the fact is, the fact is that precedents tell us that for Israel to stand up for its own rights is a prelude to the world respecting it. And certainly respect is much more important than being popular, which unfortunately has not been heeded by any, by any prime minister since the end of the Shamir's, uh, uh, Shamir's term. The solution, therefore, in my mind, is very, very obvious. It's a one state under uh, Israeli uh, sovereignty, and I'm aware, I'm aware that people usually uh, tell us, uh, give me your specific uh, solution and don't just tell me what's wrong with a Palestinian state. And I would like to suggest that it is extremely important, in fact, much more important to refute the two-state solution than to produce a, um, uh, a solution of our own, which we have, the one-state solution, and I will say a few words about it in a few minutes. It is much more important to refute the two-state solution, the Palestinian state solution, just as it is more important for a doctor to get a patient off a deadly, a lethal prescription before prescribing the appropriate prescription. And it's unheard of any patient telling a doctor, I'm not interested in you telling me why I need to get off this prescription. I'm going to continue and take this lethal prescription until you come up with an appropriate prescription. The number one duty by doctor is first of all to save the person from falling off the health cliff, from committing suicide by using that wrong pill. Then obviously doctor has to prescribe and therefore once again 
I, I cannot uh, overestimate the importance of continuously and tenaciously refuting and refuting and refuting much more important than coming up with, uh, 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 with your own proposition. And again, the solution, the way I view it, and Nadia referred to it, I believe is very, very obvious in light, again, of the context, in light of the track record, but most importantly, in light of the simple question, what are we doing here? And uh, I don't know exactly where is each one of you coming from, but I paid few visits to Wyoming, which I like very much. And in Wyoming, there is room for at least 10 million, if not 15 million Jews. Right now, there are some 600, 700,000 people. Wyoming has only one congressman, uh, while having two uh, senators, one of the very few states which have more senators than uh, House members. There's plenty of room there, and there's plenty of oil and plenty of natural gas, a lot of antelopes, and no Arab in sight. And it's much more peaceful there, and there's room for hundreds of yeshivot if one is concerned about studying Judaism. But the reason we are here is because this is the cradle of our history, and the cradle of our history has Nothing to do with Natania and, excuse me, for, with Hedera or Givat Olga. It has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, the coastal plain. It has plenty to do and it has, most of it is, is uh, founded in the stretch between Shechem, Nablus and uh, uh, Shiloh and Jerusalem and Beit Lechem and Hebron and everything which is in between. I know it leads to some unpleasant developments. And I know it requires a very heavy price, but this is the reality. Because if we are here only, only to benefit from peace and only to benefit from solid economy and only to bring down the, the cost of, uh, of living and only to make it uh, easier on young couples, I know many, many areas uh, which uh, we can achieve that much, much easier than here in, uh, um, in, on the east bank of the Mediterranean. Certainly, when it comes to security, as I mentioned before, it's untenable for Israel to revert back to 9 to 15 miles uh, sliver along the Mediterranean. This is suicidal. It has nothing to do with peace. It has nothing to do with the long-term viability of the, Jewish, uh, of the Jewish state. And therefore, whether it is called the Arab Peace Proposal, whether it is called uh, Oslo uh, Process, whether it's called Y Plantation or, or uh, uh, any other uh, type of, uh, of title, we are talking here about series of suicidal and not uh, peace proposals. I would like to end here my uh, own uh, reflections on uh, this uh, issue and turn it now to your own uh, views or uh, questions. And obviously the more provocative, the better off uh, everyone will be. Yes, please. Uh, I have two questions. One is, is the Arab uh, League proposal, is this any different from the other usual two-state solutions? No, we'll take one by one. Arab League proposal is based first and foremost on the claim of return. It's based on the UN uh, General Assembly Resolution 194, which provides for Palestinians to uh, get back to the pre-1948, uh, uh, pre-1949 uh, area of so-called uh, Palestine. That's number one. And number two, it talks about 67 lines with minor, with minor and mutually agreed land uh, swaps. By the way, there's nothing new here because that proposal was rejected by Arafat.
Arafat. That proposal was rejected by Mahmoud Abbas. That proposal was embraced by, uh, by Ehud Olmert. That proposal was embraced by Barak. And whenever they raised it, it was rejected. And the hope by uh, Arabs and the hopes in Washington and Europe, etc., is maybe, maybe that Mahmoud Abbas would get smarter and agree to receive 99% uh, uh, rather than 100% and uh, the hope that Israelis would learn from history by repeating rather than avoiding critical mistakes. Okay, the other, the other question, we're going to take a, one question that we know many people ask and we would like you to answer. Can we? Would you allow us? One second, one second. Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, you have two Just questions. One more question. The Arab League at least putting forth even a garbage proposal. Isn't that at least a step forward from the three no's that they always had, you know, no. not talking to us at all? Well, it's, it's, it's like, like asking about Mahmoud Abbas and, uh, and Haniya of uh, Hamas. In my mind, Mahmoud Abbas is much more dangerous than Haniya because one is transparent and the other one is very effectively misleading. So it is. Uh, the difference between the three no's of Khartoum and the so-called Arab League uh, peace proposal. One is tr uh, very transparent in Khartoum, the other one is pretty uh, tricky and it's the tricky one which you have to be very uh, much uh, uh, wary of. Yeah. It's a little bit off the track. Uh, I've heard reports recently that Yalom <coughs> Defense Minister Yalom, presumably with the back of Netanyahu, has agreed to build an Arab city in parts of the yeah, Jordan. It's Valley, a big mistake in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's a big mistake. It, is that is that a correct? Uh, that that's the those are the reports, and uh, and it seems to me that as I mentioned before, any any concession, be it a minor or a major, simply fuels the the eagerness of uh, the Arabs to do away with Israel, any minimal concession convinces them that only tenacity would bring them to uh, the fruition of their vision, the elimination of Israel. And the reverse is also true. An Israeli tenacious, tenacious, uh, uh, steadfast position without concessions, without as was again back in 1949 by Ben-Gurion, would lead both the international community and who knows, maybe Arabs, to realize that the Jews are here to, uh, to stay. Well, as a just the second part of it, you indicated you were not going to give your own uh, proposal. No, I didn't say. I, no, I said that I will. I said, uh, no, I, I said that we have to, to control it. Nadia mentioned about, uh, about uh, uh, voting rights or, or, uh, uh, or compensation and uh, encouraging, encouraging, encouraging them to leave. I don't have any objection for Arabs emigrating from the area, but I uh, realize it's not realistic to have a, a huge uh, percentage of them uh, following that proposition. If, if, it's, if it's feasible, I'm all uh, for it. But in the end term, in my mind, yes, Arabs in Judea Samaria should become citizens, but for those involved directly and indirectly with incitement, with terrorism. Namely, anybody who directly, indirectly is involved with hate education, with terrorism, with support of hate education or support of terrorism will not become a citizen, may not be even allowed to remain here. And because that's the nature again of Western democracies. A few months ago, I had to uh, renew my uh, visa to the US and I had to file many, many forms. And I remember few, uh, clo few clauses there had to do with my association with different illegal organizations. Have you or any of your relatives or any of your friends, etc. And I say, no, no, no. And I received my visa. And that's uh, the right way of, uh, of dealing with visa application. Certainly, it is the right way of dealing with application for citizenship. But, but for those elements, and I assume, we're talking about few hundred thousands here, 
I mean, the, the PA alone are 60, 70, 80, uh, maybe up to 100,000 people who are, by definition, if you're a in authority, you're involved in uh, hate education, in terrorism, in incitement. And then you have the, the uh, people in the d divinity establishment, people in educational establishment who are involved in security establishment, who are connected. I, I think, realistically speaking, we're talking about a few hundred thousand Arabs who are not going to be uh, privy to become citizens, if at all allowed to remain the, uh, here. Other than that, they, in my mind, should be uh, allowed. It's far less of a challenge than the one which confronted Ben-Gurion when he accepted a Jewish state with barely a majority, barely a majority in 1948. We're talking about much more promising demography, awesome demography compared to Ben-Gurion, compared to any uh, period with a very robust tailwind while the Arabs are going through historically unprecedented decline of fertility plus net emigration while we benefit from net immigration, aliyah and returnees uh, coming to, uh, to Israel. Yes, please. Um, Kerry was uh, um, recently offered the um, um, Palestinian Authority that they have given $10 billion if they'd sign a peace treaty with Israel. So they turned that down. They said, yeah. you don't want anything political. They don't want peace. And, but he's still, he's still coming back for, for another round. Yeah. Yeah. My question is that over the years, the European Union and the United States have all invested fortunes of money into the Palestinian Authority. And now you mentioned the four billion dollars that America is going to give them. No, 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 no. That Kerry said. No, Kerry said is far, far from giving because uh, okay. uh, under the American system, Kerry can say or Obama can say whatever they want. But uh, unless they get the signature of uh, of the House of Representatives in this case, uh, which along with the Senate, they control the pocket. Uh, um, in, in, in America, he will not be able to deliver. And by the way, it's not the first time. Uh, Clinton was going to underwrite our withdrawal from Lebanon, $800 million. We haven't received a penny yet because Congress did not want to sign it. But my question about the money is, how come that none of these countries have ever come and looked at their books to find out where the money is? You yeah. see why the people are suffering. Yeah. Where is the money? It was there to help the people. So the question is, where is the money? And are they keep? And I think Show me that the Arafat, Arafat, and Arafat, and all of them, their coffers are full of money. Their people are suffering. We are blamed for it. And the whole thing is it just doesn't make sense. We're talking about big, big money here from big, big countries. Where are the brains of these people? Well, uh, where, 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 are the, where are the brains of, when you say these people, let's say uh, John Kerry, the establishment of the Department of State in Washington, where are the brains of this, uh, where were the brains of these people when they embraced Saddam Hussein until literally the day he invaded Kuwait? They had uh, intelligence sharing uh, arrangement with Saddam Hussein. They provided him with dual use systems which could be used for uh, military as well as uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, endeavors. Where were the brains when they promoted the old man in Paris? to take over from uh, the Shah of uh, Iran. Uh, where were they, uh, their uh, brains? Where they courted Nasser of Egypt, uh, believing that the more they court him, the farther he will get from the USSR, but the reverse uh, took, uh, took place. Where were their brains when they leaned on Israel to allow Hamas to participate in the election in 2005, 2006, uh, and many other such. Uh, where were their brains when uh, upon the eruption of the riots on the Arab, uh, the, uh, the riots on the Arab uh, street? In, uh, in Egypt, where were their brains when they basically stabbed the back of uh, Mubarak and encouraged the Muslim uh, Brotherhood? Uh, we are talking about, unfortunately, 
systematic flawed policy by the Americans, by the Europeans in the, in the Middle East. And, and we accused of not having human rights between well, people. And what's, what's new? I mean, this is the role of the Jews. The what? But it yeah, uh, well, uh, I, I can assure you, unfortunately, don't hold your breath. As long as there are Jews around, Jews are going to be blamed. This is part of our uh, destiny, for better or for worse. And I think by and large it's for better, because if there would not be such pressure, we would not excel as we have uh, uh, since uh, Lech Lecha. Yes, please. I was going to make a point and then ask a question. The point is, I think that we're losing the public relations war in terms of the whole BDS movement that's going around worldwide that's continuing to gain stream. We're constantly being tagged now in publications and in the press as an apartheid state. And I don't think that we are being strong enough in our condemnation and vociferous enough in, in pointing out that you would not have Hanin Zawabi in the Knesset in a apartheid state. You wouldn't have people riding the, the Eged buses and the Rakhevet in an apartheid state, shopping in Yerushalayim in an apartheid state. And we're not getting that message out the way we need to as a country to let people know that this kind of demonization that's going on and on and on by the Arabs and the Palestinians. The, 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 the whole, the whole. That's my point. And then my question is, do you see any benefit even with, I'm looking at Egypt and how Egypt is reacting to actions in Gaza. Egypt has been, has been um, stopping uh, shipments of, uh, of uh, uh, explosives. They just stopped some guy with his trunk full of, of explosives headed for Gaza. They've stopped uh, a variety of different things, which I find kind of surprising in a way that they're actually making that effort. And that whenever they're finding the tunnels that lead from Gaza, they're <coughs> filling them with raw sewage to try and stop the smuggling. Do you, even, even given the far right wing, the far right attitude of the Muslim Brotherhood, do you see any kind of hopefulness that they're at least getting as fed up with the people in Gaza? Well, as, as, far, as, as far as our public diplomacy, uh, uh, there, there's no way uh, we can uh, not only win, but we, we cannot gain points in the battle of public diplomacy uh, when we uh, behave uh, like, let's say, uh, uh, Pepsi Cola uh, would behave in face of Coca Cola assault, uh, saying Pepsi Cola is poison, stop drinking Pepsi Cola, and then Pepsi Cola saying, oh, we're, we're not poisonous, and we don't think that Coca Cola is poisonous. Both of us are very, very good. Well, Pepsi Cola would then lose the entire market because the right way of doing it is to expose and to attack and not to embrace and not to go through a kumbaya type of uh, public diplomacy, which unfortunately has been the Israeli public diplomacy uh, since uh, uh, 1992, 1993. Uh, we, we call it now branding. This is the new name in the foreign ministry. Branding. Why talk about our rights? Why talk about how mean and bad and, uh, and disastrous would a Palestinian state be? Why talk about the threat to American interests, European interests, which would be posed by a Palestinian state in the area, uh, demise of uh, King Hussein, uh, promoting Russian and Chinese and Iranian and North Korean interest in the western flank of the Mediterranean. Why go through that? Why not tell the world that we love everybody, that our high tech is the best in the world, that our medical uh, innovation have saved so many lives, and that we take care of Palestinian kids, the world would then love us. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. 
when it comes to uh, to Egypt, uh, I, I also read those reports, as I do uh, read reports about supposed uh, Mahmoud Abbas security forces stopping a terrorist here and stopping a terrorist there. They do it sometimes. They don't do it most of the times, and most of the time they collaborate with the enemies of Israel. Egypt would stop a shipment to an element in Gaza which is not working with the Egyptians. But Egypt would not only promote but will also facilitate and provide uh, explosives to those elements in Gaza which they can control and Egypt did the same thing before this engagement and before Mubarak and since uh, Mubarak and the last thing that we uh, should do as a sovereign entity is to allow anybody but ourselves to take care of our interests. By the way, it doesn't only apply to security, it also applies to natural gas. I hear all sorts of ideas of developing natural gas with uh, Jordan, etc., Turkey, whatever. I think it's a big mistake. You know, after the Egyptian experience, which uh, the, had the writing on the wall all, all along, we should not repeat that mistake with any other doubtful neighbor. And all our neighbors are, uh, are doubtful. Imena Nili Mili is still very, very relevant and more so. Thank you very much. Uh, what, what's that, what's that? No, the question was already asked. Thank you. Just one more second. Uh, Thank you to Yoram, Yishar Koach, as usual, you're excellent. Uh, thank you to Dvora and Gabi Elder Otpam, and I forgot to mention thank you to Rabbi Kanai, uh, the rabbi of the neighborhood for Efrata. Shalom, shalom. So uh, uh, thank you for coming, and Yishar Koach. Uh, Rabotai, 25 years ago, Uri Avneri spoke about the two-state solution, 25 or maybe 30 years ago, for the first time, not only was he considered a lunatic, it was illegal. It was illegal to speak about a two-state solution. It was uh, uh, considered betrayal. The, how come we reach years later the point where everybody talks about it? Because he works very hard and the left works very hard at pushing and continuing to push the message on and on and on and on. So when people say, well, how can we now talk about applying sovereignty, we have to start, all of us, it starts with the matter. The politicians will change if we start talking about it, if we demand to talk Man. about it. As Judith always says, we're like on a very big ship that for 25 years has been going one direction, the direction of capitulation, of giving away parts of energy sale. And now we have to swerve to that ship and convince the captain of the ship to swerve the ship into going to Zionism, into Eretz Israel, and not to be scared to say the land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel. And we can do it. It is possible if we all take the message of Yoram and of all the other speakers, and we start talking about it at the post office with our neighbors, etc. we will be able to change it.